So the organizers did a really great job partitioning our talks because I think mine is a good follow-up to Andre's talk. I'm gonna talk about not only data-enabled products, but some of the trade-offs you'll find yourself having to make in implementing machine learning enabled products, in particular if you're working for regulated traditional enterprises like financial institutions, healthcare companies, et cetera. So I'm gonna start off with a use case. I lead machine learning, uh, the machine learning product development lab for the Royal Bank of Canada. And recently found myself and my team working on a use case that is pretty customary across large enterprises that touch lots of consumers. So the question was, can we take a process that's historically been governed by rules Every time somebody doesn't pay a bill on their credit card, make a list and have somebody in the call center reach out and make a call and say, hey Joe, looks like your credit card's overdue, can you pay it back? Turn this from a chronologically ordered process to one that looks at the probability that somebody would repay their loan without receiving a call and then rank order the calls to optimize the effectiveness of the outreach and return. So our team came in, machine learning team, and they built a super complex model using a multi-layered neural network that took in tons of data. It was able to do real-time training, but we decided to sort of turn it into it's gonna be updated once per month based on additional feedback that we had from the customers, and it had very high accuracy on the likelihood that somebody would repay. But when we got to talk with the validations team, they said, you gotta be kidding me. These features aren't intuitive. We don't really know why we're trying to reach out to somebody because you guys are putting all this data into a pot. What if we use social media data? The customers are gonna complain. So we had to reduce it down to a super simple matching of you know, input data to the output prediction we were trying to make. We had to retrain it annually. So we think about from Andre's talk, all of the super sexy data enabled products that can learn on the fly. In a regulated industry, we went to having the machine get faster once per year and we had to look at the kinds of data sets that we could use so that we had stability, so that things weren't changing too quickly, so that it could meet this annual retraining. So I bring this up as an example to ask, to pose the question to you, what are the kind of trade-offs you need to be thinking when you're managing applications of machine learning in your enterprise? And I think a good way to ground your intuitions is to ask and define what AI is using not a strict definition, but a nice intuitive jog from Jeff Bezos back in 2016 who distinguished machine learning systems from traditional software by saying that in traditional sort of software 1.0, we automate tasks that we can describe with clear rules. If this happens, then do this. And when we move into machine learning systems, we can automate tasks where it's a little bit harder for us to describe exactly what those rules might be. So classic example, spam filters, right? So in the if-then world, we'd say, we'd look at our emails and we'd say, if the email has the word Nigerian prince, put it in the spam box. If it doesn't, put it into the inbox. But you say, well, there's gonna be a lot of false positives over there, right? There's probably lots of other spam that doesn't necessarily come from our dear friend, the Nigerian prince. So we go to the machine learning version of the same application and we say, let's just take 10,000 examples and have a human come in and say, yep, spam, not spam, spam, not spam, and use that label to train an algorithm to pick up all the different patterns. Nigerian princes, spelling mistakes, time of day that it's sent, any and other anomalies, to sort of find this, not writing out the precise rules, but a probably approximately correct version of the solution. But pay attention to that. When we move from rules to systems that make probably approximated guesses, you can imagine that there might be implications for an enterprise. So for the rest of the talk, I'll provide three rules of thumb that you need to think about in managing some of the regulatory or sensitive ethical issues that you might face in using these systems with your customers. So the first is, let's call the rule of thumb the conservation of the status quo. When machine learning developers and scientists come in, their basic modus operandi is to assume that the future will look like the past, which means they can take all of this past data and use it to make some sort of prediction about a future event. That's all fine and dandy in Isaac Newton's you know, prediction of whether or not the Earth's gonna revolve around the sun at a certain time frame, but it gets a little dicey for social phenomena where we actually want the future to look different than the past. So quick example, this was reported maybe about a year ago. Amazon is one of many companies who's been trying to use machine learning systems to help consolidate and render its hiring processes more efficient. But in doing so, it trained its algorithms to find past candidates who were great 
and past candidates they may have not have hired. And lo and behold, if you've hired a lot of white males for your engineering department, the system's going to learn to find other people who look like them, which might hamper any efforts on diversity and inclusion in future hiring processes. Next example, I'm gonna follow David Deutsch's lead and call it the totally obedient moron example, which is that these algorithms that we build, no matter how smart the media makes them seem, are, they do exactly what they told, and they optimize not between the quantity or quality you think you might wanna measure, but exactly the one that it's been designed for. So two quick examples of where this could potentially go wrong. It's a great use case from Rich Caruana, who's currently at Microsoft Research, who built a network that was trying to render more efficient the process to deliver treatment to pneumonia patients in hospitals. And based on the data that he could observe, he built this neural network, and it identified that for some reason, patients who had asthma were re more readily able to be cured of pneumonia, which goes counter to our intuitions. And the reason was because what the totally obedient moron algorithm couldn't observe was that asthmatic patients tended to identify that their lungs were feeling differently much more quickly than healthy patients. So if we were to just follow the algorithm, the hospital would have made a potentially fatal decision as it relates to their asthmatic patients by not providing them care sooner if they were to strictly follow those predictions. Similar example comes from the realm of recidivism prediction, where there's a system that was reported by ProPublica in 2016 that um, was supposed to help predict whether or not a particular individual was likely to, to commit a crime in the future. Seems like it's okay, but if you actually looked at the math, it was really predicting just the simple likelihood that that person would, predict, would commit a crime. And going back to our sense of sort of social past statistics, you start to see why this particular system could potentially be racially biased against African-American males based upon trends in the American judicial system. Third use case, I'll say, be critical about the need for explanations. So we often hear in the literature around responsible use of AI that you want algorithms that are explainable. Going back to our use case from the bank, we're gonna be predicting if somebody necessarily needs a loan to see, excuse me, if we should reach out to see, to help somebody pay back a loan, we'll say we have to make this algorithm explainable so we know exactly why we're calling them. My take is that for you, if you're managing these projects, think about context. Not every algorithm needs to be explainable. And sometimes, as with a judicial opinion that was rendered back in 2012, imagine it's a legal case and the, the, the cast of hand is have we found all the relevant evidence for our case to make a judgment? Judge Peck back in 2012 said, I don't really care if this was a black box that told me to look at document A or document B. What I care about is I've seen enough of both kinds of documents to have a sense that I have a fair assessment of the evidence. So what counts there is what we call the precision and the recall the, of our algorithm, not necessarily how explainable it is. And if you're doing machine learning in the enterprise, if you think that every algorithm that you use needs to be explainable, you're gonna miss out on some of the opportunities that Andre described to be using data to make more intelligent products. So this is a quick, I won't be able to go into every box, we can talk about this more in the breakout session, but when you're thinking about using a tool, you wanna to assess six potential factors where you're making trade-offs against strictly finding the data-learned algorithm that performs best. At the heart of every machine learning case, because these algorithms are predicting things that are probably approximately correct, and they're not necessarily certain, you're always gonna have the question that you have to ask, which is, do my users care, or are they expecting something that's gonna do the exact same thing every time? So that question is always there and always needs to be considered so that the algorithms can actually be used by customers. But as you go through these assessments, you can think, should my algorithm be fair? So I need to not think about not only the entire performance, 75% accuracy on this task, but do I wanna think, is it having the same kind of performance for people from this ethnic background and this ethnic background? Is that important for me? Another example might be stability. You might say, as Andre pointed out, how much, how, for, how much further in the future are we gonna be using the data to make these predictions? Or does it just matter that I've got great predictions tomorrow, maybe in a month, or do you need to be thinking about, let's make sure that this is stable over the course of a year? And when you go through this, 
You don't want to have all of your trade-offs be made at the end of a process. So your technologists are probably pretty expensive, can waste a lot of time building super fancy machines that you might not be able to use. So it's important as you're building these things out to get involved early on in the process in design and exploration of what system you might build and actually building out these algorithms and then going all the way into putting them into production. And in the breakout sections, we'll go through the series of questions you as executives need to be thinking about with the technical teams so that you can get this stuff working in a timely fashion. Thanks so much.